Okay, so welcome to our transition metal chemistry lecture. So as you know, my name's Stephanie and we'll be going through the lecture slowly today in the video. Transition metals are our D block elements. So just a refresher on our different blocks. So we've got our S block, which is our left hand side, two columns. We've got our P block, which is our right hand side columns. So that block over here. And we've got our D blocks in the middle. So D block elements are our transition metals and the IUPAC definition for transition elements are ones that have an incomplete D subshell. Okay, so this does not include group 12 elements that have a complete D subshell. Okay, um, or they give rise to cations who have incomplete D subshells. So transition metals generally can pick up different charges depending on what environment they're in. Um, so of these transition metals we have the first, second and third series. And mostly we talk about our first series when we talk about transition metals. So electron configuration and oxidation states. Okay. So when we're looking at our oxidation states, remember oxidation is loss, reduction is gain when we talk about electrons. So when they lose their electrons, it happens from the S electrons before the D electrons. Okay, so it's a bit different to what we've done in the past. So transition metals, are, they act a little bit differently and they, they lose those S electrons before they lose the D electrons. So they, they find it more favourable to have the D electrons there because when they've got the D electrons, if it's half full or full, it drops down in energy and it actually sits in a lower energy bracket than the 4S electrons do. So that's why you've got the 3D and the 4S. So an example, okay, so if we have iron, iron without a charge on it is your same as your argon configuration and then you have 4S2, 3D6, but when we have the ferrous iron that's Fe2+, okay, we're going to be two, losing two electrons to get that two positive charge, we're going to lose those 4S2 electrons. So we'll end up with the argon and then 3D6. So the D electrons give rise to the following characteristics. So they often exhibit more than one stable oxidation state. So you might have iron 2 plus or iron 3 plus. So many of the compounds are coloured, okay, and that's because of these D electrons. And the transition metals and their compounds often have unpaired electrons and exhibit interesting and important magnetic properties, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Okay, so having a look at our pretty little pictures down the bottom here, so we've got our cobalt 2 plus, our nickel 2 plus, our copper 2 plus, and our zinc 2 plus, and you can see that they all have different colours. So remember, zinc is not a transition metal, but copper, nickel, nickel and cobalt are transition metals, and they give us these beautiful colours. So oxidation states of plus two are due to successive losses of 3D electrons. So once you've lost those 4S electrons, you start losing those 3D electrons. So if you look at the first series, oxidation state increases from plus three to plus seven, which is the total number of electrons, D electrons in that first series. So it's so plus seven is the total number of your D electrons plus your two S electrons. So manganese has the highest oxidation state of plus seven when it has the five plus two. So after the, that across the row it decreases as more electrons are added and attracted to the nucleus and because the attraction towards the nucleus is stronger it's harder to remove those electrons. So once the first half field is full, it's harder to get the second ones off. So plus seven is the, the highest that we get. Coordination chemistry. So compounds of transition elements exhibit beautiful colours. And back in the 1700s, chemists were very confused as to why they made such beautiful colours. The bonding theories back then were very primitive and they, they weren't um, incorporating these transition metals. So an example that was quite confusing to them 
um, is this one here. So looking at cobalt with chlorines and ammoniums added to it. So here if we had cobalt with three chlorines and four ammonias we could have green or violet colour. Okay, and we had the same amount of chlorines and ammoniums. So back on the, the bonding theories that they had in the 1700s, they just couldn't explain that. It wasn't until nine, uh, 1893 that a Swiss chemist, Alfred Werner, proposed the theory. Um, and the theory was that metals exhibit both primary and secondary valence. So primary valence is the oxidation number of the transition metal and secondary valence is the number of atoms directly bonded to the metal and we call this coordination number. So now when we look at transition metal complexes we look at the coordination number and the oxidation number of the metal. So you can see here looking at these ones, these examples, so when we have six NH3s it's orange, when we have five it's purple, four it's green and, and four it's violet. So we, this is a cis-trans change, okay? So trans being the two chlorines on opposite sides of the metal, and cis is when the two chlorines are on the same side of the metal, okay? And the coordination number is how many ligands, which we'll talk about in the next slide, are bound to that, that cobalt. So here we have three and four uh, in the complex, so the original formula, but what we actually know now is that we have four NH3s and two chlorines and one chlorine is the counter ion. Okay, and we'll go into this a little bit more. So we have four plus two gives us six, six bonding groups and an octahedral shape. Okay, so this is where the fun begins. So transition metal complexes. So ligands are molecules that bound to the central, or that bond to the central metal. And the common ones are water, NH3, Cl- and the cyano, or cyanide ligand. So the thing that they all have in common is they have lone pairs, or a lone pair of electrons. So they act as Lewis bases. So when the central metal is bound to a ligand, it's called a complex. And when that complex, so that metal and ligand has a charge, it's called a complex ion. So it's an ion that's a complex. Um, compounds that contain complexes are termed coordination compounds. Okay, so an example here, we have silver and we have NH3 and we've got two of those, and altogether this has a positive charge. So this is the complex ion, the Lewis acid is the silver metal, and the Lewis base is the ligands that's attaching to it, so the NH3s, and we've got two of them. So how we actually draw that out if we wanted to show the actual bonding that's occurring is we have the Ag in the middle, and we have the NH3s donating the lone pair of electrons into that silver. Okay. So it's a Lewis base, Lewis acid, it's a Lewis acid base pair. So the ligands are said to coordinate to the metal, so this is a coordination bond, um, and it donates both electrons into it. So examples of common ligands, so ligands can have groups that donate one time to the metal, or two times, or many times to the metal. So monodentate is when we have one set of electrons donating in, bidentate is when we have two pairs of electrons donating in, and polydentate is many, many electrons, uh, donor electrons donating in. So monodentate, we've got water, ammonia, fluoride, chloride, cyanide, thiocyanide, okay, so just adding a sulfur in there, We've got hydroxide and the nitrite iron, There's some common examples there, and they just coordinate one time to the ligand. So bidentate, ethylene diamine is the most common one we come across. So ethylene diamine has two nitrogens with lone pairs. So when this binds to a 
metal, you have the nitrogens coordinating twice. So one will be on one side of the metal and the other will be on the other side of the metal. And I'll show you this a little bit later on. So we're donating twice into the metal. So if the metal can only hold four ligands, four donor groups to it, if you've got a ethylene diamine, it will take two of those spots. If you have a water, it will take one of those spots. Okay, so bipyridine is another example, and we've got ortho, phenylthroline, we've got phenoxide iron, we've got the oxalate iron and the carboxate, uh, carbonate iron, sorry. Okay, so they're our bidentate ligands, so they've all got two areas that donate in. Okay, this phenoxide ion um, obviously is the odd one out here. So we got polydentate, so we got our tridentate, so poly means more than more than one, so tridentate, pentadentate, hex or tetradentate. So here we've got the tridentate, we've got the pent is five, one, two, three, four, five. Here we've got the hex, one, two, three, four, five, six, or we can have the tetra. So depending on the mode, this ligand can bind either six times or four times. So it could bind just by the oxygens or combine just from the oxygens and the nitrogens. Okay, so in the exam, what are you given? Do you need to remember all of these? Uh, yes, you do. Okay, so in the exam, you're given the table of common ligands. Okay, and it can help you with the naming. You'll need to remember which ones a bidentate, tetradentate, monodentate, um, and the examples that we use throughout this topic will be the same ones that you'll be expected to know in the exam. Okay, and you can use the common ligands table that you'll be given in the exam, so it's table 21.4, um, page 3 of your supplementaries, and hopefully work out a way for you to remember which ones are what type of donating. Okay, so charges on the coordination coordination numbers and oxidation numbers. So let's work out how we know what charge it is, what the coordination number is, and what the oxidation number is of the metal. So the charge of a complex is the sum of the charge on the central metal and the surrounding ligands. Okay, so if you know what the charge on the central metal is, you know the charge on the ligands, you can work out what the overall charge is. Okay, so it's just adding them all up and seeing what the overall charge is. So looking at this one here, we've got copper, NH3, we've got four of those, and we've got an SO4. So what you want to do is work out what the charge is on this complex that's got the square flat brackets around it. Okay, so there's two ways you can do that. You can work out what SO4 is and then know that the complex is the opposite. Or if you know what the copper and the ammonia ions are, you can add them up and work out what it is. So in this one here, we're not given information about copper. So are we? Are we given information? Uh, neutral complex, so overall charge of complex ion must be plus two. Okay, so we're, we're, not, we're not given any information, we're just given this. So looking at your supplementary sheet, you've got a table of anions on page two, and you have SO4, and it's got a two minus charge, so you know SO4 is a two minus, so therefore this complex must have a two plus on it. Okay, so that tells you the overall charge on your metal complex. The coordination number is the number of donor atoms directly bonded to the metal. Okay, so we've got ammonia and we've got four of them bonding to this copper. So the coordination number of copper would be four. Okay, and the last thing is working out the oxidation number of copper. So you know it's plus two overall. We know that NH3 is neutral. Okay, and if you forget, you can look on table 21.4, which is some common ligands on page three of the supplementaries, and it has ammonia, and it's just NH3. There's no charge on that, so that's telling you that there's no charge on the ligand. 
So then we can do it into a mathematical equation. Okay, so if these are zeros and you've got four of them and it's plus two overall, your copper will need to be a plus two. So we've got a plus two copper. So that's how we work out our overall charge of the complex, our coordination number and our oxidation number on the metal ion. Okay, so let's have a go at this concept check. So we want to determine the coordination number, the oxidation number on the following metal complexes. And in order to do that, by default, we're going to have to work out what the charge is. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of time to pause the video and have a go at those. Okay, so let's go through the answers. So question 1A, we've got a chromium, we've got OH2, which is water, we've got two chlorines and we've got a chlorine overall. So if that's got a chlorine overall, that's saying that the charge on that complex needs to be balanced out with a negative charge, so therefore it should be a plus, a plus charge overall on that complex. Okay, so we've got a plus charge overall on that complex if we split it apart. So our oxidation number, we know chlorine is minus one, water is neutral, so we've got minus two, we've got a plus overall, so this would have to be A plus three. Okay, so we've got plus three, minus two gives us plus one. We've got an extra one left over. Okay, so what's our coordination number? It'll be four plus two because we've got four waters and two chlorines, so it'll be six. Okay, and that's, that's all you need to do for these questions. So let's have a go at another example. Okay, so NO3 is a negative charge, so it's a one negative. Working that out, we know that therefore you must have a plus two overall on your complex. So working out the RH and what uh, charge we've got, we've got a chlorine and five ammoniums. So we've got a chlorine and five ammonia ions. So ammonia has no charge on it, chlorine has a negative, and we've got a plus two overall. So algebraically working that out, we must have again a plus three. Okay, and our coordination number would be five plus one, which gives us six. Okay, so write the electron configuration of the metal ion form um, in the charge that we worked out in the previous question. So chromium in the plus three, and rhodium in the plus three state. Okay, so looking at chromium, normally it's a 4s1 3d5. Okay, so remember chromium, so with those transition metals, they wanna get that half filled d orbital. So what actually happens with chromium is it promotes one of its s electrons into its d. So the correct way of writing the chromium in the neutral state would be 4s1, 3d5. So when it's in the plus three, you take away three electrons, so you just get 3d3, okay? And rhodium is your kryptonite, and then you've got 5s2, 4d7. Okay, so it's your krypton, and then you've got 5s2, 4d7, and then taking away three, you'd end up with the two S's taken and then one D, so you just get four D six overall. Okay, so let's have a look at the geometry. So most things, uh, so most metals exhibit only one coordination number. So if you have a chromium or a cobalt, they're usually six, whereas platinum is usually four. So four things binding to the central metal versus six things, okay? And usually it's four or six with, com with the compounds. So remember, if you have four things binding in, you could have square planar or tetrahedral, okay? If you have six things binding in, it's octahedral. The thing that, that 
um, tells you which way it's going to go has got to do with the type of metal iron that you've got. It's influenced by the size of the ligands. So the bigger the ligands, the less that can fit around it. And the, the angles between them uh, would differ depending on the ligand size. Uh, ligands that contribute increased negative charge pr uh, reduce the coordination numbers. Okay, so nickel makes six coordination bonds to neutral NH3, but only four to negative CN. Okay, and the size one, an example there is iron with fluorines around it. You can fit six because they're really tight and small, whereas chlorines being bigger, you can only fit four. Okay, so this is what the different coordinations look like. So we've got octahedral with our six, and tetrahedral, so the same as what carbon does, and square planar. So remember, square planar is in the plane and you just have four groups coming off it. So chelating agents are often used to prevent one or more of the reactions with metal ions occurring. So it's a way of blocking a metal ion. So ethylene diamine and EDTA, so ethylene diamine tetraacetate are the two common ones that you'll see creeping up. In case so EDTA is used in mayonnaises and frozen yogurts to prevent the metals uh, from reacting. So EN, so ethylene diamine, is a bidentate ligand. So when it binds to the metal, it takes up two spots. So one, two, three can fit around the metal if it can take six spots. Okay, so here's another picture showing you that octahedral geometry with the three ENs bonded taking up the six spots that were available. So EDTA, okay, when it's with cobalt, remember EDTA can have one, two, three, four, or six. So cobalt allows six, so it will take up all six of those sites. So metals and chelates in living systems. So the porphyrin ring is the most common one that you'll, you'll come across in biochem. So the porphyrin ring is in your hemes and chlorophyll. So in chlorophyll it binds a magnesium ion, but in your hemes it, it binds iron. So you've got iron in there. Okay, and the, your heme is part of your hemoglobin and your myoglobin. And remember, these are the molecules in your body that transfers oxygen around. So myoglobin stores your oxygen in the cells and hemoglobin um, transfers it to the different parts of the body when it's needed. So looking at that heme, you've got four donor nitrogens. Okay, so when it's bound to iron, you've got the four donor nitrogens. Uh, going to the iron and then you've got one of your amino acid side chains imidazole and you've got your oxygen in the oxygenated state so it's the O2 and it looks like this okay so you've got your heme your oxygen your metal and you've got your amino acid okay so nomenclature, so the nomenclature is really similar to your cation anion nomenclature that we've learned in chemistry for living systems, so your example sodium chloride type compounds. So within a complex ion or molecule, the ligand is named before the metal. Okay, so in your, in your simple salts, you've got your cation, then your anion. Within a complex, we've got our ligand and then our metal. So same, same trend. So ligands are listed alphabetically, okay? So names of anionic ligands end in the letter O, whereas neutral ones bear the name of the molecule. And again, you've got the sheet, so some common iron ligands, table 21.4, page three of your supplementaries, which actually already have them done for you. Okay, so chloride is chlorido, for example whereas ammonia is amine, okay, and that, that's on that sheet for you. Okay, so you've got to give a prefix, so the same way as we've been doing it in naming in the past, so we use the Greek prefixes di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, 
to indicate the number of ligands, but if the ligand has a prefix in the ligand's name, then we use our other prefixes, which are bis, tris, and so on. Okay, so an example there is ethylene diamine. Okay, so ethylene diamine has the ethyl at the beginning, so then we have to use tris. And we've got the di in the name. So the diamine, we're using di. Okay, so we need to use tris. So it's tris ethylene diamine colbo 3 bromide. Okay, so the complex, if it's an anion, it ends with H. So potassium hexacyanidoferrate 2. Okay, so if it's got a, a negative charge, it ends with H. And the oxidation number of the metal is given in your Roman numerals. Okay, so remember your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, you might go up to 7, but you wouldn't go any higher than that. Okay, and that is the table that you're given. So here you've got your, your um, complex names already sorted. So bromide, bromide, sorry, bromide is bromido, um, as I said before. Okay, so let's, let's have a go. So we've got CO, NH3, 5Cl, and we've got Cl2. So break it in the cation anion, okay? So our cation comes first, our anion comes last. So the anion is the chloride. We've got IDE on the end because it's the anion. Okay, so that one's the first half. And here, writing out this, we put our ligands first, alphabetically. Okay, and we use our prefixes. So we would get pent, Okay, we've got five, so pentaamine, okay, chlorido for one chlorine. So we only have to say if it's more than one for our, our numbering. And then we've got cobalt and we need to work out the charge. So once you've worked out the charge, you can say it's a three. Okay, so this one here. So now this is the anion and this is the cation. So it would be sodium. Uh, so we've got chlorine and we've got oxido, uh, sorry, chlorido and oxido. So um, the chlorido would come first. So we've got tetra, chlorido, oxido, molybdenate, and then four oxidation state. Okay, so you've got minus four, your oxide is minus two, and you've got a a um, plus two, so that cancels that out. So that would have to be a plus four. Okay. Okay, so have a go at these. Just pause the video and have a go at trying to work these ones out. All right, so what we're going to do is go through these now. So let's go through the first one. So working out, we've got our bromine is our anion, and this will be our cation. So the charge on that nickel, so we'd have a plus two, these are neutral, so the nickel would be a plus two. So we would have, uh, we've got six, six NH3s, so six amine, and then we'd have our nickel, two bromide. So six, remember, is hexa, amine, nickel, two bromide. Okay, and this one here, Again, it's our cation and our anion, so chloride would be our anion. Um, cobalt's charge, so En is neutral, Cn minus, this is neutral. This is a um, plus two, so cobalt must be a plus three. Yep, so plus three, so we got that aqua for water. Again, this is off your sheet. So there's only one of them, so we don't need to use uh, uh, any numbers out the front of that. So we've got aqua, cyendo, bis, ethylene diamine, cobalt, cl three chloride. Okay, and our last one here, now it's the anion, so we've got to make sure we add iod at the end of it. So we've got sodium, uh, this is 
uh, plus 2, so this must be a minus 2 overall. Uh, so again, we'd have a plus 4 oxidation state on our metal. Okay. So putting that together, we've got sodium tetrachloride oxido molybdenate bor. Alrighty, so moving on from our nomenclature, let's look at isomers. So remember, isomers are the same formula, but they have different properties. So the two types of isomers we have are structural isomers, which differentiate um, by the bonding that's occurring, or we have stereoisomers, which is the same bonds but different arrangements. So our structural isomers, we have coordination sphere isomers, or linkage isomers. So coordination sphere isomers, an example here. Okay, so we've got a different coordination sphere. We've got the same, okay, so we've got chromate. We've got six waters and three chlorines, but they're coordinating in a different way. Okay, so, so how are they? The, the six waters are bonded with the chlorines or is the chlorine okay so here we've got our six waters bonded to the chromate and our chlorines counter eyeing here we've got five and one and then we have the the two chlorines and the water counter ironing okay so how they're actually coordinating around that metal is different we also have linkage isomers so if you have a group that, for example, has a nitrogen or an oxygen donor. So whether the nitrogen or the oxygen is actually coordinating into that metal. So here we've got our nitrogen, so NO2, the nitrogen's bonded, and we have this colour, whereas if the oxygen is bonded, we'll have a different colour. Okay, so that's just the linkage on that ligand. Okay, so our stereoisomers, so geometric cis-trans, Okay, so whether they're on the same side of the metal or opposite sides of the metal. So cis platinum here is our example. So cis platinum in the cis state is a, is a really effective treatment for cancer, whereas in the trans state it's not effective. Okay, so cis on the same side and trans on opposite sides. And lastly, we have our optical isomers. So remember, our optical isomers are where you have the enantiomers and you have that mirror symmetry between them, and they're non-superimposable. Okay, so superimposable, think of your hands. Okay, if you hold your hands out in front of you, you cannot lift them up and place them on top of each other and match them up. They're non-superimposable. Okay, so predicting optical isomers. Okay, does either cis or trans, CO, Cl2, En2, with a positive charge overall, exhibit optical isomer, isomerism? So given the formula, and we know that the bidentate ligand En is in there, can we arrange it so that we have a cis-trans option? Okay, I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a go at that, pause the video. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So drawing it out in the trans configuration, so trans is on opposite sides, so those chlorines can be on opposite sides or the uh, ENs are on opposite sides. Okay, we've got a mirror there. Can we pick them up and place them on top of each other? Yes, we can. So they're superimposable, so no, they're not isomers. Okay, they're identical. And doing our cis one, so when we've got our two ENs on the same side and our two chlorines on the same side. So having a look at that, if you literally pick up the molecules and place them on top of each other, you know they're not superimposable, so yes, they would be isomers. Okay, so if you think of checking are they superimposable, so the nitrogens can be your fingers and the chlorines are your thumb. So holding it on the left, you're making the picture on the left, holding out your right hand, you've got the same picture 
is the right so pick it up and see can you place them on top of each other and they match no you can't so they're non superimposable okay so let's get into color so color so color of our transition metals is something that really dif differentiates them from your other elements in the periodic table so the color depends on the particular element the oxidation state of that element and the metal uh, ligand bonds that are found in the complex. So for, for something to have colour it must absorb some proportion of the visible spectrum and we use this colour wheel of complementary colours to explain this. Okay, So this is our visible spectrum, Okay, so it goes here, it is down here in a, in a um, different format showing you the different wavelengths. So as you as you look through this spectrum you can see your different colours so you've got your blues and then you go into your greens, yellows, oranges and reds. Okay. Um, if we make this into the, the colour wheel you can see what is the opposite. Okay. So when something is absorbed the opposite is what we see. So if a compound absorbs a wavelength uh, say 420 we will see a yellow complex so it's the opposite that's why it's complementary colors okay so magnetism so transition metals can exhibit either paramagnetism so when they have an unpaired electron at least one or diamagnetism when they have no unpaired electrons so how do you know if a complex has paramagnetism or diamagnetism we can put them in a, a, a magnetic field okay and when it's diamagnetic it's slightly repelled okay so it's non-magnetic um, it's got that repelling um, and that's because there's no unpaired electrons but when it's paramagnetic and it's put into a magnetic field it attracts to the magnetic field and the unpaired electrons align parallel with one another so they they line up and this is what we use for NMR, so Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, which we will talk about in ABL for those of you that um, carry on in the research major stream or choose it as an elective. Okay, so crystal field theory. So it's a, the bonding model for transition metal complexes and it accounts for the colour and the magnetism that we find on these transition metal complexes. So metal ligand bonds, okay, so this is our, our metal and this is our ligand and when the ligand donates the electrons to the, to the metal we get a metal ligand bond. So this can be an iron-iron interaction or an iron dipole depending on what the ligand is. So obviously it would be a dipole if it's a polar molecule and an iron if it's an ion such as chlorine, you'd get that iron-iron or iron dipole. So remember the driving force for any chemical reaction is a decrease in energy. Okay, So this is the same here. So when the metal iron and the ligand bind together they result in a lower overall energy. So let's have a look at octahedral complexes first. Okay. So when we have our free metal ion, our energy is down here. Okay. When we have our metal ion plus the ligands, okay, and we get our octahedral coordination occurring, we have this octahedral crystal field theory that we come up with. So basically we have E sets and T sets, so T2 and E sets. So depending on the different orbitals that we're talking about. So the E set are the orbitals that point directly towards the ligands of the octahedral. So you've got above and below and then you've got the four in the plane. So that's our DZ2 and our DX squared minus Y squared are the names for those two um, orbital, orbitals that we've got. Okay, so we haven't really talked about these in the past, but now you're going to have to try and start remembering them. There's five of them. So there's dz squared, dx squared minus dy squared, and they point directly towards octahedral ligands. 
on the axis that the ligands would be on. The T2 set, which is your DXY, DXZ and DYZ, point in between the ligands. Okay, So when they're pointing in between the ligands, they have a lower energy. When they're pointing to the ligands, they have this negative charge repulsion and it has a higher energy. So it's a lower energy to fill the T set, the T2 set, rather than the E set. Okay, and you've got an energy gap between the two. Okay, so how does, how does this explain the colour? Okay, so the energy gap between the d orbitals is the same order of magnitude as the energy of, of a photon of visible light. Okay, so that gap between the T2 set and the E set equates to a photon of energy and that equates to a colour that will be absorbed, okay, if you have a DD transition. Um, so a DD transition is when you have an electron moving from the lower energy to the upper energy, so it becomes excited, so it absorbs the photon of energy, it gets excited and moves from the ground state to the higher state, and then we observe a colour. And that colour is the, um, the wavelength that you see. So if the wavelength is 495 nanometers, okay, so that's in here, it's a green, so we're going to be seeing a red colour. Okay, so the magnitude of the, the energy gap between your two states, so your T2 and your E's, um, is dependent on the complex that you've got. Okay, so it's dependent on the metal and the ligands. So the ligands can be arranged in an order of their ability to increase that energy gap between E and T2, and it's called our spectrochemical series. So here we've got our high energy gap, so we're increasing as we're going this way, so our CN minus has a high energy gap, whereas our CL minus has a low energy gap. So the energy gap, low energy gap is a longer wavelength, and a high energy gap has the shorter wavelength. Okay, And these are what we call weak field ligands and strong field ligands. So strong field ligands, high energy, short wavelength, weak field ligands, low energy, longer wavelength. Okay, and let's look at some examples of how we actually apply this. So here we have a, a, a couple of different coloured complexes and we know what their, their, um, their uh, oh, what am I trying to think of, uh, their complex formula is. So they've all got chromium, and chromium is your argon with 3D5, 4S1, okay? When it picks up a 3 plus charge, like it has in all of these complexes, you have a 3D3. So we've got 3D electrons. So if we were to draw out the crystal field splitting pattern for this, so our T2's at the bottom and our E's at the top, so our T2's will have one electron in each, okay? So this one is with fluorines, this one's with waters, this is with NH3s, and this is with CNs. So our CN, remember, are our high field, high energy, and our CLs, or our fluorines that we've got here, are our low energy, okay, so low field. So looking at them, okay, so starting with fluorine, going to water, uh, ammonia and then our CN minus, you can see that energy gap is getting bigger. And because of that change in energy gap, we've actually got different colours. So the F uh, fluorine green has a longer wavelength. Okay, so we've got a really kind of long wavelength that's absorbing in the red area, so we're going to see a green complex. Okay, and as the wavelength gets shorter, we're going to, um, okay, so we're getting shorter, we're, we're absorbing in the yellow, we're seeing violet, and as we get shorter again, we're now absorbing in the violet and seeing the yellow, okay? So this is our longer, and as we go around, we're getting shorter. 
So the yellow is when you have the biggest energy gap because it's absorbing the shortest. And our green is when you have the, the largest, uh, the smallest energy gap and the longest wavelength. Okay, so let's have a look at our electronic configuration in these octahedral complexes. So when you're filling them up, you need to think where is that D electron going to go? So again, our Hans rule and our Alfbaum principle, okay, so we're going to be filling the lowest energy and then doubling those up, or we could go to the next box. So it depends on what sort of energy gap we've got between these T2 and E D electrons as to where it's going to go. Okay, so we've filled up our three and then we're putting in our fourth one. Will it double up down in the T2 or will it go up to the E? So favourably, we want one in each box before we start doubling up. So we've got to work out, is it going to cost it more energy to double up or is it going to cost it more energy to put it up into the E block? Okay, and this sort of information that we can get is dependent on a little bit more information that we've got. So we need to know whether it's a high spin or low spin or what, what kind of ligand we've got there, looking at the spectrochemical um, series and seeing, okay, if we have a CN, then that's gonna be a big gap. If we have a fluorine, it's gonna be a small gap, okay? So here, if we've got a fluorine, we've got a small gap. So if we had the extra electron, it would go up into the E, okay? And if we've got a big gap, so CN is the ligand, then it would definitely go down into the T2. Okay, and that's just looking at the ligands that you've got to work out which one it would go to. Okay, so this example here is quite complicated. So what we want to do is convert from wavelength to energy absorption. So we know what wavelength these metal complexes can absorb and we know what colour it's going to produce, but we want to know how much energy is being absorbed from that photon. Okay, and the formulas that we use, we can use the Planck's constant formula, the speed of light formula and Avogadro's formula. So the speed of light is a constant, our wavelength and our frequency is all related together in this triangle. And then we have our frequency, which is also in our Planck's constant formula. So our H is our Planck's constant and E is that energy that we're getting. Okay. So what energy is associated with 530 nanometers um, converted into kilojoules per mole? So we want to get energy, okay, and we're given our wavelength. So firstly, we put it into this formula, find out our frequency, put our frequency in here, find out our energy, and that'll give us our energy, and then we need to convert that into energy per mole. Okay, so just going through that. So firstly, determine the frequency, okay? So that will be the uh, speed of light divided by the wavelength. And we've got to do this in meters. So our conversion here is one nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. Okay, and then we get our, our, um, our V, so our frequency. And then putting it into this one here, we've got our frequency times our Planck's constant. Okay, and that would give us our energy. And in this one, we've got it in joules, so converting it into kilojoules because we're asked for it in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so it's 3.74 times 10 to the negative 22 kilojoules. So now to do this as per mole, okay, so we've got our energy, okay, and we divide it by our Avogadro's number to give us our moles. So energy divided by Avogadro's number will give our energy per mole. Okay, so that's quite a complicated example there, but that is how you would convert uh, from wavelengths into energy. Okay, so let's do a concept check. So how many unpaired electrons would exist in a six coordinate high spin and low spin complex of Fe3 plus? Okay, so this is assuming it's octahedral 
okay we've got a six coordinate so it's octahedral what is the high spin what is the low spin and fe3 plus how many transition metals are there so i'll give you a little bit of time to think about that one if you want to pause the video have a go and then come back and check it okay so let's have a look at the answer to this one so fe3 plus how many d electrons that is five d electrons so it's 4s2 3d6 then we take the 4s2s away because we've got that 2 plus and we've got 3 plus so we take the 2 and then one of the d so we end up with 3d5 so high spin low spin so high spin is when they're close together so that you could put one in each box and low spin is when they're far apart so you have to start doubling them up so in the high spin state we have two four five unpaired electrons and in the low spin state we only have one because we've got the doubling okay so that's octahedral tetrahedral and square planar are different so tetrahedral is the opposite so now the ligands are in a different spatial arrangement so the ones that were pointing between the ligands are now pointing to the ligands and the ones that were pointing to the ligands are now pointing between the ligands because we've gone from six to four okay so now we've got our e set at the bottom and our t2 set up the top okay square planar is a lot more complicated and we have this interesting split so we've got our our um couple of our T2s down the bottom and then we've got another one and then we've got uh, so this is our T2s this is an E this is a T2 and this is an E so it's a little bit um, spread out okay okay so let's have a go at a concept check okay so nickel complexes with a coordination number of four can be either square plane or tetrahedral we know that the nickel chlorine is paramagnetic whereas the nickel CN uh, is diamagnetic okay so that tells us about how many unpaired electrons there are if there are any so one is square planar one is tetrahedral which is which okay so if you want to pause the video draw out your energy splitting diagrams fill them up see what you get for both of them and and see how you go okay so let's go through the answer all right, so we know nickel has 3d8 in the 2 plus state, so losing those 4s2s, we've got 3d8. Okay, so tetrahedral, square planar, filling up from the bottom and, and going as you go. Square planar has no unpaired electrons, whereas tetrahedral has two unpaired electrons. Okay, so remember unpaired electrons gives you paramagnetic and diamagnetic is when you have no unpaired electrons. Okay, so if this is diamagnetic, then this will be the nickel CN4, and this is paramagnetic, that'll be the nickel chlorine 4. Okay, so putting concepts together. <coughs> okay, so what we want to do is show the structure of a complex formed by coordination of oxalate to cobalt. Okay, so remember oxalate is bidentate, and this is the uh, complex here <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we want to write the formula for the salt formed upon coordination of three oxalate ions with cobalt 2 again assuming the charge balance in cation is sodium okay so I'll give you a chance to pause the video there have a go at doing these questions and then play the video and check how you go okay so the oxalate ion uh, the oxalate ligand bonding to the cobalt okay so we want to see the uh, cis trans versions of these ones okay so cis being on the same side and trans being on the opposite side okay so we've got our cis here and we've got our waters okay um, trans would it occur no probably not because it's a long long stretch from the top to the bottom okay so here it's just asked us to draw it out it hasn't said how many of them or anything so we just need to draw out one possible structure for it 
Okay, so with the next one we've got, uh, we know this has a negative two charge on it and we've got three of them, so we'd have a negative six. So this one is a plus two. So plus two minus six gives us minus four, so we have to balance it with four sodiums overall. So we get Na4CO, C2O4 uh, with a three and our big square brackets around our coordination compound. Okay, so charge transfer colours are more intense colours, so they're really, really vibrant colours. And this is what you'll see when you have the DD transition. Okay, and we'll see this in the lab next week when we do our lab. So the colour of some colour transition metal complexes are due to another type of transition. So actually from an electron to a ligand to an empty D orbital in the transition metal. <coughs> okay, so it's a ligand metal charge transfer, LMCT. Okay, and examples here we've got a violet, a yellow, um, and that is a metal ligand charge transfer. Okay, we won't, won't really go much into them, just to say that you can have other kind of uh, transfers of those electrons. Okay, and here are your references, and good luck with the two questions. Remember these lectures are not a replacement for actually attending the lecture. We go through a lot more in the lectures, but these are just as a study aid for you. Um, thank you for listening to the video, and good luck with the topic.